Um, perhaps I should say a few words of introduction just in case there's anybody in the room who doesn't know your work, but I guess that's, that's probably unlikely. Um, Simon is Chair and Professor of Philosophy at the New School in New York. He's published a lot of books, uh, too many to mention here, but I'd point you towards The Ethics of Deconstruction, Very Little, Almost Nothing, Things Merely Are, Infinitely Demanding, and his recent bestseller, Group of Dead Philosophers. <coughs> now, I was going to say thanks for being here, but you're not here. So, <laughs> Thanks Almost. <laughs> but that doesn't sound quite right either. <laughs> um, so I'm left wondering about what this space is, you know, the space of the interview where I've invited you to be welcome. And I wonder whether we could start here or there or wherever this where? or there uh, might be. Can you hear me? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Is everybody in the audience here okay? Is it? Is it? We will. We'll be panning the camera around as well. Okay, so okay. Like... But you can, you, so you can hear me. Okay. Um, can I just say hello? Um, can you pan the camera? Yeah, well, hello to James. And um, I want to just uh, embarrass James because uh, he was a brilliant student, the last really good student we had at Essex before I left. So I'm very delighted, you know, the, to be here and to... Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't be there. But I had to um, stay here and wash my hair, and uh, I really wanted to be in the place where St. Paul was shipwrecked. Um, but, you know, I, I hope to visit in the future. I'm sorry I couldn't be there with you. Can I just do some sort of shout outs? Is that okay? Sure, sure. All right. Yeah, sure. To uh, Ivan Callas, who I've not, I, mean, I, I hope to meet bef before too long. Um, wait, wait. All right, hello uh, to, uh, to, to Kate Belsey. Hello, Kate. Yeah. Hello. She got me my first job. I love you. I love you forever. Um, uh, the good old days in Cardiff. Um, to Aaron Jaffe, is he there somewhere? I don't know. Uh, Lebowski rules, etc., uh, etc. Et Joel Mador. Um, hi, hi, Joel. Okay, is Fiona there? Yeah. Hi, Fiona. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, friends for colleagues for many, many, many years, and um, I'm going to Anfield on Sunday. Be pleased to hear the um, uh, and and uh, to Jean Michel as well. I'll see you in I'll see you in Philly at the end of the month for the um, that party. Um, okay, I've said my hellos. I don't know whether I'm here or there, but we're we're somewhere anyway. I'm in a basement in Holborn. Well, was it easy to find? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank God. Anyway, it's very good. Okay. Um, well, back to this virtual space, whatever it is. Um, yeah. It certainly didn't, certainly didn't exist when you started your academic career. But whatever it is, it's undoubtedly now undoubtedly demands recognition as a legitimate and I suppose increasingly institutionally colonized academic site, perhaps futural in its anticipation of the changing styles of academia and scholarly dissemination. Um, this is something that you seem to have embraced. I mean, you just have to glance at your Wikipedia page, which not insignificantly is detailed, to see lots of links to podcasts and so on. And I wonder whether that's something that you embrace just because it's an inevitability, or whether you see it as a, an important opportunity. It's an important opportunity. I think it's, you know, we... Um, uh, I'm a bit of a Luddite when it comes to technology, but I've got a very good assistant who does all that stuff for me and also I like free stuff I like free things and you can just distribute sort of horizontally I like the sort of horizontal forms of communication and dissemination you get with uh, the, the new media and I'm very curious about you know the new forms of, of media I'm not you know um, I'm not a technology enthusiast or a technology sort of evangelist but I'm, I'm very I'm very curious about the new forms and also the new forms of um, you know, um, I mean, you know, the, the sort of pseudo authenticity of this that you know, I'm I'm sort of there and I'm not there, but also the new forms of identity uh, complication that it can produce. I mean, I uh, and fraud. I mean, I'm very interested in fraud and theft and all these things. For example, there's a uh, there's a false um, uh, a false Twitter feed for me, which is interesting. So occasionally, 
you know, messages will go out from me which aren't from me, which I quite like as an idea of just complicating whatever, whatever identity might, might be. And also, you know, uh, I was doing some work recently, and I'm going to come back to this maybe later on, uh, with the, uh, the International Necronautical Society, which is one of those projects I've been involved with for years, and we did a, an event at the Tate Britain um, in January where we, were, we, we gave this declaration on inauthenticity where we were played by actors. We trained actors, it took an awful long time to, to do, and uh, we trained them, they performed, and of course they were, they were better at being ours than we were. And wow. for a lot of people in the audience who didn't know who, it was me and my friend Tom McCarthy, novelist, didn't know who we were in a sense they were they were more real than we were and it goes back to this idea that you know um, you know the Warhol used to say that you know I used to before you know before um, before he was shot he used to think that TV was reality and after he was shot he was certain that TV was reality so there is that uh, interesting you know, that new forms of impersonation complication and fraud that it allows which complicate the ideal of authenticity which is something I'm against <laughs> Do you follow that Twitter feed? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, not really, no. No, no strangely enough. There's, a, there's a, a fake Zizek one as well. Uh, yeah, well, I've, the fake Zizek one, I've, I've had fake, there's been a fake debate between the fake Zizek one and my fake one, which is sort of interesting. <laughs> to turn to style itself, Yeah. Uh, it's clear, yeah. clear from your work that style does matter. Uh, it's something that you cultivate in your own work, and it's something that you're attentive to in other writers. I'm just going to give you a few examples of where you refer to the style of, of other writers. Um, in Very Little, Almost Nothing, you remark on Emerson's style, which has a staccato muscularity. Yeah. In On Hitler, you speak of the telegraphic conciseness of Freud's late style. In Ethics, Politics, and Subjectivity, you refer to Genet's style as simple, direct, without pretension. Yeah. Elsewhere in that, we claim that what we might now call Derrida's late style marks a move away from the theoretical and the performative towards the quasi-phenomenological. It's an interesting point. And in the ethics of deconstruction, you refer explicitly to the style of deconstruction. But I'd like to ask you, if I could, about four styles in particular, the styles of four writers in particular, Montaigne, Blanchot, Heidegger, and Beckett. Mm -hmm. In your recent book of Dead Philosophers, you refer to the, and I quote, highly personal style of Montaigne yeah. that is able to map the movement of the mind. For Montaigne, Montaigne, you write, the manner of writing is as important as the matter. Yeah. Blanchot, Blanchot uh, you praise his limpid clarity, economy, and strangeness. And you've criticized the inelegant prose of Zion and Weiss and spoken warily of its dangerous power, which I think is mm -hmm. also an interesting idea. Beckett, I mean, Beckett's clearly a, a very important writer uh, to you, for you. Um, and there's a tantalizing footnote in Very Little Almost Nothing, which you don't really develop, but if you could say something more about it here, it'd be great, um, mm -hmm. in which you defend, you defend Beckett against J.M. Kurtz's suggestion that Beckett's style is a prison. Yeah. So I wonder if you could elaborate on the styles of, of those four writers in any, in yeah, any it's way. A, it's a brilliant question. Um, uh, style is obviously a huge issue. It's a huge issue for me. The the four authors. Let me take them in in turn. I mean the. Um, I mean Montaigne. What interests me about Montaigne is all sorts of things. But um, what I like to think of as a informal philosophy, as opposed to the, as opposed to the formal, um, impersonal, style of say analytic philosophy. Um, what you have in Montaigne is an, is an informality, and an informality which attempts to, you know, map uh, the movement of the mind, or seems to map the movement of the mind as it as it, as it is enacted. And it's also, um, you know, autobiographical, which interests me. The way the way that Montaigne is autobiographical and extraordinarily intimate, at the same time as not being um, self-obsessed. I mean, Pascal says about Montaigne somewhere that it's not. Uh, it's not Montaigne we see when we uh, when we read Montaigne. It's us, and there's something about Montaigne. And also the there's a the way in which he uses citation. It's something I'm interested in in other contexts. That there's a style of building, as it were, an informal approach through an accumulation of citation, which for me is uh, you know is is a precursor to that Benjaminian idea of of citation without citation marks. So in a sense, in Montaigne, you get that 
massive accumulation of citation, which interests me as a style. In relation to uh, Blanchot, I mean, the first book I ever read in, in French was uh, L'Espace Littéraire, because it was so, um, it was so limpid and, and wonderful to read, and I've always been uh, fascinated and perplexed by Blanchot's style, which is, on the one hand, I mean, the essays he did for the Nouvelle Revue Française, which were incredibly uh, clear and limpid, yet had this uh, obscurity at the same time. And so what, what Blanchot was able to do was to, as it were, write short, clear essays, which at the same time had this sort of, you've got the sense of this huge, uh, opaque terrain, sort of numinous terrain at the back of his, uh, his discourse. I've never been able to, to mimic it, and very few people, very few people can. Heidegger, you know, who, who remains for me, you know, the philosopher, uh, for good or ill, for good and ill, rather, um, it seems to me that Heidegger's career is a career in style. I mean, uh, I've been doing work on uh, the early Heidegger for a number of years, but um, it seems to me that all that changes in Heidegger's work is the style, right? We have the same matter, the same matter of thinking, and different approaches to it. And he goes from the, as it, from the, um, the lecture, the philosophical treatise, through to the sort of autobiographical rumination in the Beiträge, through to some rather bad poetry, to the essay, to whatever, to different forms of meditation. So in a sense, Heidegger is all about uh, style. And in a sense, uh, maybe the tragedy of Heidegger's work is that what he does is to just uh, continue to try and build castles in the air in style that attempt to, as it were, capture this, this matter. Um, Beckett, for me, is the, is the man, right? Beckett is the man. And um, what, what fascinates me about Beckett is the, both the neutrality of, of Beckett's style, um, also the fact that this is a style that's mediated through a foreign language. Beckett only becomes Beckett through the mediation of French. So that's that sense in which, you know, the style of writing in a second language and the necessary sort of impoverishment of one's language that that, that enforces, that's interesting. Um, I think uh, also the, uh, the, the, the humour of Beckett, you know, which for me is, uh, is exemplary, you know, there is rapture or there should be in the motion crutches give and so on and so forth. But also there is something in that style which is that, you know, what, you know, what Bart used to call a you know, degree zero style, a sort of stripped down style, which is also capable of expressing extraordinary pathos. So what I particularly like in Beckett are the late short prose pieces like Ill Seen, Ill Said, and company, which are able to, um, in this extraordinarily sort of neutral, impersonal style, evoke, uh, evoke incredibly powerful affect. Right? There's nothing affectless about, about Beckett, on the contrary. There's, there's a, and there's even, you know, as bad you said, there's, there's a nostalgia in Beckett, which I find very compelling. So those four authors would be sort of, you know, exemplary in different ways for me. I wonder if we could um, move on to the Develop the style in your own work and perhaps yeah. some of the implications of, of that development. Um, now, your first book, The Ethics of Deconstruction, um, I mean, first books have a style of their own anyway, obviously. Yeah. But after the publication of that book, you were, in your own words, determined to make the second book as different as possible. Yeah. And I, I wonder whether that has anything to do with what I would read, incorrectly or correctly as your equivocal relationship with theory. Mm -hmm. um, in the preface to the second edition of Very Little, Almost Nothing, which was your second book, you declare that structuralism is a term you've never really understood. Yeah. Post-structuralism post -structuralism is a term you neither use nor recognize. Yeah. And that postmodernism is a term which you are on record in numerous places as disapproving of for both philosophical and sociological reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, Elsewhere, in very little, almost nothing, you refer to the rather precious and irritating profile of the Kula Barton of the Felicity Absolute. Yeah. And yet, and yet the, the Ethics of Deconstruction, easily your most theoretical book, was taken up into sort of theoretical canon. Yeah. So I suppose my question is, to what degree, if any, did an uneasy relationship with theory shape your second book, Very Little, Almost Nothing? It did, well, yeah, I mean, yes. Um, the, um, I mean, just a, a tiny bit of context there was the, um, um, 
I actually owe this to, to, to Kate Belsey as well. She put me in touch with a very good editor at Blackwell called Stefan Chambers, who I, I don't know what happened to Stefan, but he was a very, he was a great editor. And he took a, took a risk on the ethics of deconstruction, I mean, way back when in 1990 or something. And, um, you know, and then when it came out, it came out a month after the, uh, the Cambridge affair, when Derrida was initially denied uh, an honorary doctorate at Cambridge. And there were... You know, the front, the, the headline of the Independent, I remember, was something like um, "Value-free nihilism hits English city," right? And uh, you had the sense in which so so deconstruction was front-page news, and what was what was at the centre of that was the question of nihilism and the question of whether this was a value-free uh, approach. And then the ethics of deconstruction came out the month after that, and I you know benefited from that 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 luck, but that was also a, you know uh, thanks to a a clever editor, and which I wish there were more of them out there. Um, the, um, but then after that, I was determined because you know the, the difficult thing, and obviously you know with, with writing, is getting a book published, and then then when you've got a book published, and you know someone read it to get to do another thing, and then you know you, people tend to write the same book over and over again. I was determined not to do that. I wanted to write something as far away as possible from uh, from from uh, the ethics of deconstruction, and that became very little, almost nothing, and the. Um, so it's designed to do something different. There's also, I mean, you know, running through that book, and I want to come to this later on in some of the other questions that you have, is the, um, I do have an anxiety about uh, theory, uh, because, um, I mean, I hate, um, I've always been very suspicious of a sort of supermarket approach to theory, that as it were, you get an object, like, you know, whatever it might be, uh, middle March, and then you can read it in a Marxist or a feminist or a post-structuralist or whatever way. That seems to to me to betray the object. That what I try and do in in relationship to whatever I'm thinking about is to try and follow the particular, follow trace the material, particular artwork, whatever it might be, uh, literary work, and try and be um, try and find in writing some affluence of that thing. In, uh, in, in, in one's writing. So that comes back to style. So I've always been anxious about that supermarket approach to theory and uh, the, the, uh, the temptation to reduce it to a series of um, terms like post-structuralism, post-modernism and the rest. I mean, I, you know, I learned, I learned how to sort of talk the talk of structuralism but just never felt it. Um, that's maybe my problem. Um, I've got some more stuff to say about uh, the relationship between theory and practice, but I want to bring that in later on, later on if it's okay. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, if you could say something else about, you know, because you did come back to the second book again later, and, and you did, I, as I understand it, rewrite parts with an explicit effort to try to improve the style, you know, you see yeah. that in the, the preface. Um, yeah. Looking back on the reworking of the second book, I mean, how do you, how do you feel about that book now? How do you view it? Um, do you see, uh, yeah. I suppose the underlying question, I suppose the underlying question to that is, does style change with age? Well, yeah, um, a lot of things change with age. Um, <laughs> but um, um, there's a, I've got a relationship of what Lacan would call, you know, enamoration, you know, love-hate for very little, almost nothing. I see what other people like in it, and I don't really see... I see what they say, but I don't really see it myself. I find it um, over, overwritten and painful, painful to read, obviously, because it's, it's about my father, but it's not really about my father, and uh, you know, it, there's nothing obvious about that in the text, but for me, it's about him, and I still miss him terribly. Um, age, in a way, clarifies style, you can say, um, uh, on, on the one hand, and, you know, you... you, you you get to a point where you can say things more clearly than you could say when you were younger. On the other hand, uh, I've been writing some of my most uh, obscure stuff recently and really been messing with, with style in a whole number of different, different ways. Like I was writing something recently on, uh, on David Lynch's Inland Empire um, yeah. with, my, with my wife, which was uh, extremely obscure and writing something on mystical anarchism, which was maybe even more obscure. And I want to talk about, maybe at some point later, about collaboration in relation to style, because the thing that interests me very much is extended forms of authorship and how they affect questions of style. That, you know, there is one writing oneself, but what I'm trying to do 
in a whole number of uh, different ways is to, is to work with other people, to write with other people. And that does something very interesting to your style. I mean, basically what happens is that you begin to write with somebody you admire, trust, and your, uh, your superego shuts down a little bit. That prohibiting, inhibiting superego can shut down a bit and you find yourself saying things which you wouldn't normally say. And that can be really exciting. Uh, but I want to come back to that later on, actually. But the, um, yeah, yeah. But for um, me, you know, I'm interested. I'm, you know, I'm interested in these different styles. I mean, for example, the the blog, the blog as style, and you know, using that. Uh, this year, I've been experimenting with things for the New York Times and the Guardian. You know, using the discipline of the 800 word unit, the 800 word lump of text as as a way of you know, explaining something or trying to address something. And there's a discipline there which is sort of interesting. Uh, and that, that's, in the case of The Guardian, that's the Being in Time blog, isn't it? Yeah, eight blogs on Being in Time, which was uh, which was extremely you know, strange thing to do. And then um, you get all these stupid responses, but there you go, that's the internet for you. Um, I suppose this kind of feeds into that because you've just demonstrated from what you've said that your work is far from being narrowly academic. And you've yeah. about poetry. You've written about a film, as you say, recently um, collaborated with your, your wife on that very experimental piece on, on Lynch. Um, and I wonder whether you are ever conscious of adapting your style, you know, understood in a broad sense, your written style, your intellectual style, to the, the thing that you're writing about. Yeah. And I suppose particularly in the case of poetry or um, film or artworks in general. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, completely and uh, unreservedly. I mean, I, you know, art is about, you know, repetition and theft, and so is, and so is what we do. I mean, and so, uh, but to give that a sort of intellectual, you know, frame, I mean, a, a hugely important uh, essay for me has always been uh, Blanchot's um, Literature and the Right to Death. And in, in that essay, Blanchot talks about the two slopes of literature. Uh, the two pistes, you know, that you can ski down. And one is the, um, the slope uh, of the, uh, the reduction of matter to form. Uh, so in a sense that one, one approach to, to things is those things become uh, ma matter which can be, can be formalized, uh, rendered, uh, sort of aufgehoben in the, in, in the Hegelian sense, into, into the form of conceptuality. And that's... Uh, uh, an approach that Blanchot associates with the work of Hegel and also with the, the pornography of the Marquis de Sade. It's a very interesting uh, argument. That's one slope. The second slope is the attempt to, um, to let matter matter, as it were, to not reduce matter to form, but to let matter be matter. I mean, the, those are the last words, actually, of Flaubert's Temptation of St. Anthony, which is a text which interests me for all sorts of all sorts of reasons, but you know, uh, and uh, uh, Blanchot is thinking about um, a number of things there. But one uh, poet that's on his mind is, is Ponge, is Francis Ponge, and the idea. If, if you think about Ponge's uh, poem on the orange, I mean, the what he's attempting to do there is to let the orange orange, or let the bridge bridge, let the jog jog, whatever it might be, let the oysters oyster, and so. Uh, for me, it's a, for me, it's about style is about trying to follow the particular, follow the object. And uh, so what I, this comes back to what I'm suspicious of in theory. What I'm suspicious of in theory, capital T, is the reduction of particulars to some uh, framework, some, some grid which makes them intelligible. I want to do exactly the, the opposite, to try and show how... Uh, Theory, in a sense, um, or, or theoretical discourse, conceptual discourse, meets a certain limit when it confronts an object. And it's um, uh, so, I mean, the way I've tried to describe this recently is, is, is a difference between, let's say, a philosophugal approach, a philosophugal approach, which would be the attempt to sort of, as it were, to uh, philosophical concepts go out and spread themselves over objects, you know, which is the risk of certain forms of. Of, think of Lacanian film theory, where every film suddenly looks the same. You know, we, do, we go searching for the breakdown of the symbolic and find the moment of the real in every movie. There's a, there's a, there's a danger there. What I want to do is to, is to, is to do a sort of thingo-petal uh, approach to uh, style, where, in a sense, 
uh, the writing can try and uh, find some uh, adumbration, some affluence of the, the material thing. And to let, so to that extent, um, you, you borrow from the object as closely as possible. Another thing in relation to that I wanted to say was um, also about collaboration. Um, yeah. I'm fascinated with what's going on in, in contemporary, uh, contemporary art at the moment. And one of the things that's been going on the last uh, 15, 20 years is, is a whole emphasis upon collaboration, on joint authorship, and uh, which, which for me comes back to the idea of whether you can construct something like a, a collective intelligence or uh, the idea of a group of some sort, where you can, as it were, lose yourself in forms of collaborative practice. And there are artists, for example, there's an artist who I'm very enthusiastic about called Philip Pareno, a Parisian artist, and I'm collaborating with him on some uh, on some projects at the moment, and you know we're uh, and this is part of a sort of a, an attempt to sort of lose ourselves in each other's work. I mean, we read the same books. He works in images. I work in words. And, and since there's something incredibly exciting at the level of style to, to collaborate, I mentioned the INS, where we uh, the International Necronautical Society, where we deliberately say use the style of say the manifesto. Uh, in particular, the Futurist Manifesto, the 1909 Manifesto, it's the, it's the centenary of that uh, this year, Marinetti's Futurist Manifesto. We use the style of that in order to produce a sort of a, a, a declaration, a manifesto. That, that interests me. And then, um, you know, forms of uh, style, the, the, the conversation, the, the, the polylogue. Um, uh, I mean, that there, are, there are endless possibilities, it seems to me, which need to be explored. But I think part of it goes back to breaking down the unit of individual production. I'm very keen on that. I mean, what's happened in, in Britain, I mean, you know, one of the reasons why people like me got out, and it's also the case elsewhere, is, that, is the individual as a unit of production in the humanities and social sciences. And I think uh, collaborative work is a way of, uh, way of undermining that. And also, you know, you, um, as I said before, you can, you can, lose, your, you can lose your inhibiting superego a little bit, writing and working collectively. So that's um, that's something I'm very interested in. And this this really links into my next question, um, because you've spoken about losing that inhibiting superego in a relationship with the object. And I suppose what I want to ask you about now is the impossible object, death. Oh, can I just say one thing before I go? Because the other, yeah, which, she, I mean, yeah. one 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 thing which just comes to mind is that the I work with this novelist um, Tom McCarthy, who is who's a genius. Uh, wrote the book called Re Remainder, and, it, and uh, what's interesting about that form of collaboration in relation to style is that you know, as as an academic or as a philosopher, maybe uh, you you learn you you think uh, you think in lines, argument lines, or in terms, or you think vertically in terms of assembling a, a conceptual a series of conceptual distinctions or whatever. Whereas he thinks horizontally and associationally, so he'll say, you know, there's this moment here in Shakespeare which is like this moment in Faulkner, which is like this moment in, in Nabokov, which reminds me of this episode of Scooby-Doo, or whatever it might be. So you know, there's, a, there's an accumulation of associations. So I'm very interested in, in people that work horizontally and people that work vertically. And the two things together can be rather interesting, I think. Anyway, that's just a, an aside. Death. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Death. Yeah. Um, an abiding concern of your work is human finitude um, and the question of how one should live or perhaps one could say how one should style one's being in relation to death. Now it seems to me that in many ways this might take us to the heart of your own style, understood again in its widest possible sense, um, which I would venture, to, you know, you, I'm, I'm interested in what you have to say about this, but what I would venture to describe as an ataraxic style. Yeah. Ataraxia, of course, refers to a calmness born of an acceptance of a finitude in a, in a godless universe. As an intellectual style, this ataraxia seems to determine the sort of poetry that interests you. So I, I think of Pessoa, I think of Seasons. Yeah. Certain, certainly the sort of humor that interests you, you know, the, the Beckettian writer's purists, the yeah. last that last. Um, and the sort of philosophers that fascinate you, fascinate you most too. But I, I think I would go further and suggest that in your work you've developed a distinctly ataraxic aesthetic style as well, mm -hmm. one that conjures a certain poise and a sense of detached calm. Calm is an important word we could come back to. Um, yeah. A style that 
can be both compelling but also strangely disconcerting. <coughs> now, it's said we never really know our own style, but I wonder whether mm -hmm. there's anything in that description that you would identify as your own. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I begin from the, um, um, you know, again, Blanchot's um, idea that, in a sense, the, our relationship to our own work is one of self-deception, right? the way in which, you know, demand develops that in blindness and insight, that, you know, one, one is blind to what one does, so I'm blind to what I do, and uh, therefore, you're, I, I hope you're right. I mean, I couldn't possibly say... Um, you were always such a good and careful reader, James. So I think you're probably. Uh, I mean, you. Ha I have no, you know, rights of authority over these these things. I mean, and, and so in a sense, it's. Uh, I accept that. But in relation to calm, I could say something about yeah, about that. You. I mean, I an ataraxia. I mean, I um, calm um, calm crept into uh, my discourse when I was writing an essay on Terence Malick about um, eight years ago now, uh, because there's, a, there's the appearance of the word calm, and it, it just at the level of association uh, made a link to uh, a moment in Heidegger's What is Metaphysics, where he talks about anxiety, angst as a form of ruhe, as a form of calm or peace. And that was, uh, and it was that calm or peace that, the protagonist in, in Malek's Thin Red Line was trying to achieve in relationship to death. So that, it crept into my vocabulary there. I also found it all over uh, Stevens's, Wallace Stevens's late poetry. Uh, and I was very interested by that. There is, again, this goes back to the question of age and style. If you look at, say, Stevens's style and many poets' style, Stevens goes from a florid, sort of manneristic, uh, gaudiness in the early early poems uh, assembled in harmonium to this incredibly spare style in the late works, um, the plain sense of things, not ideas about the thing but the thing itself, which attempt to um, again to, to follow things with a certain material, natural things with a certain calm. So I'm very interested in that disposition of calm, and then on that basis. Uh, a step back to uh, Epicurus and Epicurus's uh, use of ataraxia in the, um, in the letters, uh, which interests me in, in enormously, and also other appearances of the idea of calm in classical Greek philosophy, uh, which is sort of all over the place in, in classical Greek philosophy. And uh, in the, and this is, you know, I, I'm interested in Epicurus because of the, what he called the tetrapharmakos, right, the four-part cure, you know, don't fear God, uh, don't fear death, what is good is easy to get, and what is terrible is easy to endure. So that four-part uh, cure. But it also relates to the idea, which will sound weird, particularly over the um, a sort of video conferencing thing, the idea in what it might mean, the idea of what it might mean to live like a god, right? which um, is something that you find in Epicurus, you find it strange remarks uh, in Plato to do with this, and you find it, I think it reappears in, say, someone like Spinoza. Spinoza's idea of blessedness or beatitude is an idea of, as it were, uh, becoming godlike. And there is... Um, so, so, so calm is tied up with those set, that set of associations which I'm trying to sort of uh, think my way through, but... I mean, the last thing I finished writing was a thing on, um, on St. Paul, for this thing on St. St. Paul's Cathedral uh, on St. Paul uh, the other day. And, um, you know, there it's a question of anguish. You know, the, if you like, the, the, the style of... Um, what interests me, interests me about Paul is the style of the epistle. Uh, the epistle as uh, an urgent uh, communicate to an audience... Uh, which is defined by the anguish of waiting. That's another sort of mood that I... So, so there are these you know, different affects that, that flows around. But the, I mean, the, the, what worries me about calm is the sort of the quasi-Buddhistic uh, aspects of it. I mean, I did, I did a piece for the New York Times in the uh, summer, which is on this moment of calm in Rousseau's reveries. It wasn't just about Rousseau, but I was, sort of used that as a sort of uh, ploy... I mean, Rousseau, 
after colliding with a dog in the streets of Paris in the, the second uh, reverie, uh, 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 regains consciousness after several hours. Blood is streaming out of his mouth, and he looks up at the night sky and feels calm for the first time, this, what he calls this, this sentiment of existence. So I wrote about that, and then um, you, know, you get 400 responses, some of which say, oh, well, this is just like neuroscience, right? Or other responses go, oh, this is just Buddhism. And I'll say, no, it's not Buddhism. So I'm a little bit worried about the, um, the idea of calm now, to be honest. I suppose we could um, but take that up. But is interesting, what you're saying. Well, I was going to ask you about how one would translate that, you know, this interest in calm and perhaps an ataraxic style, um, to politics. You know, where, where would the political motivation yeah. come from? Yeah. Uh, you've mentioned St. Paul. You might want to say uh, more about St. Paul. But I'd like you to also say something about political styles in general. Okay. Uh, in particular, two, two, well, one figure and one movement that you've written about recently and that you're writing about, um, Barack Obama yeah. and neo-anarchism. And if you'd right. like to add anything right. on St. Paul. <laughs> uh, it's my final question, so I'm cramming in as much as I can. Yeah. Uh, Barack Obama as neo-anarchist, that would be the, um, I mean, I, I uh, you know, um, lived through the election, presidential election last year, which is very interesting for all sorts of reasons, but um, I'm not, um, I'm not a liberal. <laughs> and I, I see Obama, Obama as the, the, the best last gasp of classical liberalism. But what I thought I want, what I wanted to do was just to read everything by him, because the extraordinary thing about Obama that people don't seem to uh, take seriously is the fact that this is this is a this was uh, a presidential candidacy campaign that was based on autobiography right? and a style of autobiography. He's written two autobiographies. I mean, Rousseau wrote three, and Rousseau was about as weird and paranoid an individual as you can imagine, you know, I mean, remember David Hume says, you know, in his 10 page essay on, uh, on my own life, you know, it is not good for a man to talk about himself for too long, therefore I will be short. So Obama, I think, is, is fascinating from this question of style because he constructs uh, an identity, namely the identity of Barack Obama, one book about the mother, the, the uh, Audacity of Hope is about the mother, uh, Dreams from My Father is about the father, and he constructs this, uh, this identity, which I think is trying to um, cover over an extraordinary um, horror of the void. There's a horror of um, emptiness and lack of connection in Obama, which, which writing tries to fill. Uh, and, in, and when writing doesn't fill it, there's, there's his commitment to historically black Christianity and then his commitment to the constitutional order of the United States. So. Um, there is something for me uh, absolutely uh, and essentially disconnected about Obama, which is interesting. Uh, and the fact that um, the fact that you know uh, the president of the United States has uh, is his identity is a consequence of literary style. I think is is something we should perhaps attend to more. Neo anarchism. I could talk all day about that. Which is you know there's a um, a uh, couple of things. Firstly, the, the idea of um, uh, of comedy in relationship to uh, politics is something I could maybe talk about. But maybe uh, it wouldn't be calm and uh, so neo anarchism. If there's if there's a let me put it this way, the first uh, political emotion I think is anger. Right? Anger is the first political emotion, and it's a question of how. Uh, that anger uh, is articulated, finds articulation politically. And for me, that's the key question. And I, um, I wish people were more angry than they, they are. I mean, maybe they are more angry than they're, they're letting on, but I wish people were more angry because it's, um, you know, the last, the last year has been the most uh, extraordinary sort of um, uh, demasking of, you know, uh, of, of the ideology of uh, neoliberalism that we were, all the theology of neoliberalism that we were indoctrinated with for, for decades. And, uh, you know, uh, I, would, I would hope that there was, there was more, more anger. I mean, the, 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 there's been a turn towards, you know, I've, I've never really been a, 
a Marxist. I'm interested in Marx, but I was never really, never really clever enough to be a Marxist. And um, it was, um, and so what, what's happened in the last five or six years is that really, through all sorts of uh, details I could go into, I found myself drawn more and more towards uh, forms of, of anarchist politics, both the anarchist tradition, uh, Bakunin, Kropotkin, right the way through to contemporary uh, neo-anarchist thought. And I find that um, anarchist practices of direct democracy, uh, construction of affinity groups, the working through of consensus and the rest, I think is a, is a fascinating way in which politics uh, can happen in a place like the United States, under the radar. Uh, it's, yeah. it's always, there, are these, there are these strong local anarchist traditions which I think are, are mis, uh, misperceived elsewhere and I find the, sort of the last best hope for uh, uh, forms of social transformation. That's very time. Thanks very much. Um, we're going to open it to the floor if that's okay. We've got time for a few quick questions. I know there are people who are quite eager to ask questions. So if you could pan the camera around to whoever wants to ask a question first. Hi, Simon. This is Ron. Uh, hello. Whether you can see me, yeah. I can uh, see you. It feels a little you. like, you know, being at the hairdressers when you look at the person who cuts your hair in a mirror and he looks at you. <laughs> Uh, I, thought, I thought you were copying my hairstyle, Jean-Michel. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I was not to go to the hairdressers. Um, I have a, a, a simple question to go back to, uh, say, Levinas and the, the names you mentioned in passing. On my way to Malta, I, I stopped in Paris and I uh, took a good look at the recent book they published of Levinas notebooks on over mm -hmm. yeah. and what struck me was really the literary nature of the uh, the style uh, yeah. and the wish to be a novelist as it were yeah. and I was wondering whether this is a fairly basic uh, but for me worrying question beyond individual styles um, for instance, for me, what's always been revealing was a difference in style between Levinas and Derrida. Would mm -hmm. there be something like a phenomenological style, for instance, that would be partly literary, partly philosophical, yeah. based on the description? And if so, would that be something you would recognize as being, in a way, a component of your style? Uh, well, I'd, I'd yeah. like to. I'd like to think so. I mean, I, you know, I'd, I'd be um, hesitant about comparing myself with such uh, eminences as Levinas. But I mean, I think that Levinas. <clears throat> I mean, the. Um, I mean, Levinas is the, the maybe the thinker that I've been most attached to for over the years and, and uh, I'm also very distressed about how Levinas is, is read and understood, you know, he's reduced to an idea of ethics as first philosophy, Levinas relationship to the other, blah blah blah, and now we're meant to be moving beyond that, back to the same, you know, bad use critique of that in ethics and whatever. And I find all that really fatuous because um, for Levinas, Levinas for me is about style. And the early work and the late work, in particular Autrement Quatre, but also the early work like De l'Evasion, which is all about literature, um, are marked by an extraordinarily intense style right? and, and, a, and a very peculiar use of, of syntax and a, a language which he says is almost barbarous. So if you say, you know, he, he's, um, uh, he's also writing as a foreigner, right? I mean, Levinas's domestic language was Russian until the end of his life. He spoke whatever, Yiddish, Russian, so French. And, and you know, he was, he never had a professorship in, in philosophy uh, because he didn't do the aggregation. He didn't do the aggregation because his French accent was too poor. He was told by Leon Brunschweig, I think, and his, uh, his Latin and Greek were not adequate. So there's a sort of agony of style there. It's a foreigner's inhabitation of the French language, I find very interesting. Um, you know, Levinas's uh, key concept, early concept, this concept of the, of the ilia, that there is, 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 a, is something which arises out of uh, 
uh, an experience of, of the literary and then informs the experience of the literary. So, you know, there's this, this concept so is like a sort of um, a ping pong ball between Levinas and Blanchot, where, where Blanchot's early, uh, early uh, récit are sort of elaborations of this idea of the there is, the sheer there is of things. So, so that's something I've always been enormously attached to, that what um, is the idea of a reversal of intentionality, right? So if phenomenology is about um, the intention, intentionality thesis, what you find in Levinas is the attempt to reverse the order of intentionality, uh, which, which comes to this idea of the horror of the ilia and tracking that neutral anonymity of things. And that's something that... Uh, so when I was talking about um, uh, Ponge earlier on, that's, that's, not, that's sort of the, uh, the sort of... Um, the, the inside of that thought is that the, uh, what we're trying to track in those particulars is the is their thereness, right? Their the dark, uh, shadowy thereness, which which resists us. Um, so, yeah, I still I still think of myself as a phenomenologist for sure. Um, yes, hello. Um, hello, James. Hi, I'm Gloria Lauri Lucente, and um, James starts uh, the interview by saying that you are here with us, but not within the space. Yeah. And I have a question um, to you from someone who is neither within this space nor within your space, but he's in New Haven right now, Giuseppe Mazzotta. Oh, yeah. He says hello, he sends you <laughs> his warmest wishes. I don't think you've met, uh, have no, you, never so met far? Him. No, you haven't. Never had the this would have been an opportunity. Unfortunately, he was unable to attend. But anyway, he sent me um, this question, so I'm ventriloquizing Giuseppe Mazzotta right now. And um, he quotes Deleuze, who in his book on Proust suggests uh, that style is a perspective or a way of seeing. Now, yeah. is style then tied to a modern principle of individuality? However, Mazzotta also adds, this implication sounds rather absurd, for it does not explain the style of antiquity. So what do you think about all of this? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know whether style is, you know, <laughs> style is, um, uh, is something modern in that way, something, you know, in a sense, um, I mean, just yeah, I don't know. Gen I generally, I couldn't really answer. Let me give a sort of, you know, uh, a partial answer would be in relationship to uh, American literature uh, or American thoughts. I mean, the a thing that interests me is, um, say, style in American poetry, and um, you know, there is there's something that goes on, say, in. Um, um, in Emerson, in Emerson's essays, uh, which is a hugely idiosyncratic style of thinking. It's close to Montaigne. I mean, he's like the American Montaigne, Emerson, uh, through citation, the accumulation of these sort of aphoristic insights. And that seems to unleash uh, both a style which is distinctive from what seems the European um, and unleashes, as it were, uh, an idiosyncratic idea of style that you find developed in, in Whitman, in an obvious way, Song of Myself, uh, in, in Melville, in another way, then right the way through to, to, to more, more contemporary poetry. So what interests me about, say, American poetry, and this is, this is a banality, but it's an interesting one, is the fact that, that form, uh, form is uh, very much the development of individual style. Right? So each great American poet seems to have their own style, right? whether it's... Uh, William Carlos Williams or, or Stevens or whoever, uh, or, 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 or um, Ashbury. The, um, but more generally, I don't know, because you know, the start in antiquity, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very complicated question, because um, I've been doing some work on antiquity the last few years, and sure, it's right, there are dramatic differences of style. And also, you know, uh, we've, got, we've got no clue. I mean, the style of the dialogues, of Plato's dialogues, is absolutely opaque to me. The more time I spend reading them, um, uh, so I could say a little more about that, or the style of the, um, uh, the style of pre-Socratic fragments and so on and so forth. And of course you, you can't, how you disentangle these things from their reception of course is impossible as well. 
mean, because when I read the Prusocratics, it's like reading surrealist poetry, but that obviously wasn't the case with the, the Prusocratics themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you. Hi, Simon. It's uh, Mark Robson. I'm hi, Mark. For a while. Are you there? Hi, Mark. Hi. Yep, hi. Uh, I just wanted to link a couple of things that have come up so far. I mean, James used the word calm about your style, but I wanted to talk about that as um, yeah. patience instead. All right. Because your suggestion that your reading is a kind of response to an object and that you're always trying to respond to whatever it is that you're confronted with. Yeah. I wondered how that may have shifted as your work has become more explicitly political because one of the, the necessities within political response is a kind of impatience and anger, as you suggested. Yeah. So does it demand a kind of a different style of reading? Yeah. Uh, yes, it's a, good, it's a good point. I mean, there's a, you know, the... Um, I became a... Um, at the level of style, if you compare, say, um, uh, the ethics of deconstruction with infinitely demanding, there's a very different style. I think infinitely demanding is an infinitely better book, but it's it's incredibly economical in terms of you know I, uh, there's there's a concision there which I wasn't capable of, and maybe I, uh, you know, okay, let's let's put it this way: I mean, a name that's missing from. Uh, infinitely demanding is the name uh, of Derrida. I think maybe makes it into a footnote. Uh, and, you know, there were, uh, there was a tendency uh, amongst certain inheritances of deconstruction towards a certain prolixity, one could say, um, which didn't seem to match the urgency of the times. Uh, and I, that left me feeling slightly frustrated. And, um, you know, it's um, what I tried to do in Infinitely Demanding was to try and write in an incredibly, you know, concise theoretical style, which I guess was influenced by another style, uh, which is, uh, to give it a proper name, would be the style of Badiou. I mean, Badiou's thinking, I was reading from about, the, from about 94, 95 quite closely, but it had an effect on the way in which, not the content of what I thought, but the way in which I decided to express it. So, although there, there are many irritating things about, about Bad Yu's work, uh, and many things to criticise, I find the, the, the economy of expression incredibly, uh, incredibly powerful. And it is you know, linked to a certain impatience. And an impatience that I ended up having, say, with the style of deconstruction. Let me put it that way. Great, thank you. I think we've got time for one last very quick question um, hi, hi there Ben Hutchinson University of Kent uh, my question hi. is about hi sorry my question is about um, well starting with St Paul you mentioned St Paul in his epistle and of course yeah. that makes me think of St Paul being, being shipwrecked here in Malta which makes me think then combining those two things of the message in a bottle and um, Mandelstam and Ceylon picks up on this um, uses the idea of the message in a bottle as the description of a poem, that a poem should be like a message in a bottle, thrown out, um, but not to anyone in particular. So there's a degree of kind of directionality, but an intransitive directionality. And I, I, I'm just wondering if that applies to, to style, one could see the style in those terms, building on what you said about the idea of the epistle. Yeah, I mean, you could, yeah. I mean, the, um, what interests me is the, uh, in the, the style of Paul, is the fact that, you know, here we have um, a hundred odd pages of epistles that were written over a ten year period and they're marked by an absolute urgency and uh, defined by a mood of, of anguish. And they're addressed to specific communities, right? Paul is addressing the Corinthians, the, the Galatians, places he visited with the exception of Romans, right? Where, which is a place that he, he hopes to visit on his way to Spain, right? on his way to Spain, the very ends of the earth uh, in, 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 a, in, 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 his, in his world. And so um, what interested, interested me about Paul at the level of style is the idea of the epistle as that which is addressed punctually to a community which is in relationship to a series of other communities. And the style 
of each of the epistles is different. When he's talking, when he's talking to the Corinthians, he's talking about uh, problems of, of ecstatic experience, glossolalia, mystery religion, and all the rest. When he's talking to the Galatians, it's to do with the issues of a relationship to Jewish Christianity, and so on and so forth. So I'm very interested in that. So in a sense, you know, Paul's epistles are messages in the bottle which managed to wash up on the shore in an extraordinarily massive, massive way. But, you know, that, that's all. Also, another thing I should, I should mention is that I've been in... There's been an awful lot of um, uh, student protest in the last year. In, um, it's now sort of taking place in, in the California system because of the cuts there. But also we have, we've had a, a long and bloody campaign at the new school uh, to do with our, with our president. But uh, that's produced an interesting style of intervention. Uh, I, I guess it's a text that people have, have read and looked at now. But the, uh, the, the text associated with the Tarnak Nine Tikkun, the Invisible Committee, uh, Theory of Bloom, and all of these texts, I find extremely interesting at the level of style, because what they've uh, unleashed amongst uh, student activists that I'm uh, in touch with is uh, uh, a, 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 a rapid dissemination of written texts, which are disseminated by hand. So they're... Um, so every week or two, I, someone will come into my office and hand me a text and say, read this and then leave. And there's this sort of deliberate avoidance of new forms of technology, Facebooking, social networking, and the attempt to cultivate a network by an actual manual transmission of, of a text. And that text is written in uh, an incredibly impatient style, which, which, which recalls forms of situationist intervention from the 60s, and I find incredibly interesting. And what these, and what these, these kids are doing, and they are kids, uh, you know, they're hoping they're sending messages in, they're sending messages in bottles because they're um, a little bit angry. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Simon. Could we give Simon a hand? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for being there. <laughs> thank you, thank you, James. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. See you. Have a good day. Okay, bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're disconnected. Yeah, I think we're disconnected. There we go. You survived. <laughs> <laughs> it's a strange experience. Yeah, you have to see yourself more than anyone else. I know, it's rather weird. But that went rather well, thank you very much.